put himself into this zone and his eyes went all sort of fluttery, crazy and everything. And then he, his eyes snapped open and he described in great detail um, as though she was in the room standing beside me, this woman that I had a relationship with before I'd met Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't ended well and she she was, um, and he, he described her in not, not sort of in ways where he's groping for detail or anything like that. He described her vividly and certain things about her so that, yeah. Which I found a bit freaky to be quite frank. And, um, and he said, she's still angry with you. And I said, yeah, that'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, she has her hands around your throat and she's trying to strangle you. Would you like me to release her? And I said, yeah, please. <laughs> so he did that. And then he went back into his place and we put his hands around everything and his eyes opened up again, suddenly. And then he described this scene where I was in, um, I was on this trellis in stocks, you know, this medieval village square. And um, my throat had been cut, but in a way that I was bleeding slowly and dying slowly. Mm. And evidently I'd been speaking out against the church and the church had, um, had done this, the churchmen had done this, had, had um, put me in the middle of the square to stop me uh, as an example for other people not to speak out against the church. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome to Accentuate the Positive with Karen Swain. It's always wonderful to be with you again. I've got a little friend here that's come to say hello. He always jumps on me when I start the show, so he's going to be harassing me all through this as usual. And remember, if you're enjoying our conversations, to like and share the conversations and leave your comments on the YouTube or send me an email if you're listening on audio and all that good stuff and press that subscribe button, all that good stuff. I have again on the show the wonderful Bill Bennett filmmaker from Down Under. Welcome to the show, Bill. So great Thank to have you back on the show. So I, I spoke to Bill in 2018 about his documentary. Let me just read a little bit of his bio, then we'll get into it. Bill Bennett is an award-winning filmmaker, author, producer, and director of feature films and documentaries. In a career spanning more than 30 years, he's made 16 feature films, four dramatized documentaries, and five feature-length documentaries. His feature films have won numerous awards, both in Australia and internationally. There's a long slew of awards that you can read about or you can listen to in our last um, conversation. Bill started his career at med school and then deciding to go into media, working in media for the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting, for about 10 years. He then went into independent film production in the 80s, but it wasn't until he made his last documentary film called PGS, Intuition is Your Personal Guidance System, that his life changed forever. As I said, I last spoke with Bill in 2018 about his wonderful film, PGS, and we got into it. It was, quite, it was a great conversation. I was just telling Bill before I pressed the recording, I did a lot of yakking, so I'm not going to do so much yakking. This time I'm going to let you do you do the talking. <laughs> so if you haven't seen the conversation I had with him last, please go and have a listen and also check out his amazing movie about intuition. It was a transformational ride, which we'll go into in this, but you've got a new venture and that is doing a documentary on fear. Mm -hmm. You've started that. When did you start that? Now, I started that about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, while I was making uh, PGS, one of the things that kept on popping up throughout the making of it, and then I got, I got to say as well, once I started screening the film to audiences, one of the big things that came up was that fear is the biggest inhibitor to intuition. 
we have these intuitive impulses, but then fear kicks in and we don't, a couple of things happen. We either don't believe that it is an intuitive impulse or that we do maybe on one level acknowledge that we've had an intuitive impulse that our intuition says we should go this way. We should take that job. We should hook up with that person. We should make this business arrangement or whatever, but fear presents itself in terms of logic or rational thinking or what some people euphemistically call common sense. Um, and that is, <laughs> and that is, one of those things are, are an, an expression of fear in one form or another. And fear kills intuition stone dead. And so I started to think about that and I started to think, well, what is fear? I, you know, I think I know what fear is, but kind of, it's a little bit like intuition. I, I thought I knew what intuition was before I went into making that film on intuition. Then I got, got into the film and realized I didn't have a bloody clue what intuition was. <laughs> Um, and the film was um, transformative for me in that I learned what intuition was and I learned to trust it. And in the process of learning to trust my intuition, I remember at one point getting up in front of an audience, I think in Australia here, and saying, now I'm largely free of fear. And it was a very dangerous thing to say, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because we're never free of fear. But I got to thinking about fear and thinking, well, it would be really interesting to explore fear in a documentary. So 18 months ago, I set off around the world um, with a camera crew and I started doing interviews and shooting some film. Uh, the, film the film is called Facing Fear. It's not finished yet. Um, it will take the same format as PGS and then it's largely interview based, but, and it will be personalized in the same way that um, PGS was personalized through, through my story and my understanding of fear. Anyway, has that answered your question? <laughs> Look, it has, you actually answered a few questions that I had uh, on the tip of my tongue. Cause I was, I was listening to you on Adam uh, Sandler's show, not Adam, sort of Michael uh -huh. Sandler's show, Inspire Nation. Mm. Uh, this morning and I and I listened back to our conversation 2018 mm. uh, just to get a sense of what we're going to talk about I knew I wanted to talk about fear and I heard you say to uh, Michael that your wife Jennifer Clough mm. was always into spirituality when you were not mm. and I heard you say that she was listening to cry on and you thought oh turn that stuff off I can't you know I can't come at it it's not logical. Don't, why are you listening to it? Like I heard you say that to, to Michael on his show. And I was like, wow, really? Wow. Yeah. So do you think that your, uh, what did you call it? Common sense, not common sense, but logical mind and being so resistant to what she was listening to. Do you think that was fear? Well, of course it was fear. Um, it, was, it was fear. But also, Karen, you've got you to remember, I came from a household of very evidence-based thinkers. Both my parents were dentists uh, and all my siblings have gone into the medical professions. Um, and the conversations we'd have around the dinner table were never about anything esoteric uh, at all. Um, we were barely religious. And, and so, and then I, of course, I went into med school, realized that it wasn't for me then went into journalism and journalism only reinforces the notion that you have to be evidence-based in your thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so that was my, that was my background. Jennifer would, Jennifer was listening to cry on very early on, I think in the early, early two thousands um, before he really took off and she'd play, she'd play cry on in the kitchen while she was making dinner. I'd say, I cannot, I cannot come into the kitchen while that stuff's on. <laughs> I mean, and Lee Cow, I've, I've actually become quite good friends with Lee Cow, um, who is the channel for Fire. Um, and he's extraordinary. Uh, but, you and, know, the funny thing was... And I, very the, down to earth. <laughs> very down to earth. He's a very, very, very sweet man. And, um, you know, I finally 
in the making of PGS, I remember kind of going, uh, I discovered that uh, Lee Carroll was going to do some cryon channelings in Australia at Uluru. And without asking her, because I thought that she would be in agreement, I went online and I booked the tickets and, you know, arranged for, for us to go to Uluru and interview Lee Carroll. I told her this and she said, what did you do that for? That's stupid. I, I, you know, I know, I know Lee, I know all of Lee Carroll's work. That, that's a dumb thing to do. I went, no, 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 we're going and I'm going to do an interview with him. Anyway, she, she recounts how at the end of the interview, Lee Carroll and I stood up and we hugged and she stood back at the back of the auditorium where we were. And she said, I could not believe it. There is, there is my husband hugging Cryon when all these years he's been screeching that the guy's a kook. <laughs> well, when I heard you say that to Michael, I thought to myself, wow, your relationship must be so much better since you made that movie. If she is someone that for 20 years was listening to someone like, you know, cry on channeled messages mm. and you were someone going, oh, turn that stuff off. I cannot listen to it. Mm. Your, your relationship must be so much closer. It is actually, yeah. It has been because now, whereas before she couldn't talk to me about all this stuff, yeah. now we sit down every morning and that's all we talk about. Yeah. yeah. You know, years ago I used to run the Academy of, of Light, which was um, a Monday, Monday night um, meditation and guest teacher. Mm. And uh, the biggest complaint back then, going back around 20 years, and it's still a big complaint, I was in my 30s and most of the people coming were 50 plus. Mm. And uh, they were all complaining about how their husbands were not into spirituality and they could not get them into spirituality. <laughs> like that was the biggest complaint back then. Mm. I, think, um, I think things have changed really since then, but there's still quite a few complaints about women being into it and men not. So, and You know, if you go to a cry on event, it's, it's interesting to look around the audience because there is a large percentage of men at those events. Yeah. And Lee talks about the drag-alongs, you know, the, the, uh, that, that's what he terms them, the people who come along because their wives said, listen, you've got to come, you got, they, they, they drag their husbands along. And there are some drag-alongs, I'm sure, but, but there's also a lot of people, and you talk to them, you know, you go to these events and you talk to people, and they're really into it, you know, so, so I think things are changing. Mass awakening. Look, mm. um, I wanted to chat to you about fear today mm. because... We've been through, or we're going through, we're in the, still in the middle of it, mind you, the, um, the riots have tend to taken over the pandemic news, <laughs> but we're supposedly in the middle of a pandemic. Mm. I had a beautiful teacher in my online group uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, called Belinda Womack, who channels the 12 Archangels. And she was channeling most of the time, actually, when we were talking to her. And we were talking about the pandemic, and she said that the purpose, the spiritual purpose of the pandemic was to bring up the fear and the polarization in to the collective, like in a very, you, you can't hide it sort of way. And so it was bringing up everyone's fear. Mm. And uh, yeah, like what's your perspective on what's gone on with fear and the pandemic? Well, it's, um, it's been very confronting mm. and it's been very challenging for a lot of people, for most of us. And, you know, fear is presenting itself in a whole lot of different ways. It's mm -hmm. fear of loss of job, loss of income, loss of everything you've worked for, um, fear of getting sick, mm -hmm. ultimately fear of dying. Yeah. Um, all of these different fears, it's, it's pressed a whole lot of different buttons. And I think one of the reasons why the, the riots have been as... Um, vigorous as they have, as violent as they have, and impassioned as they have, is in part because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. because there, there has been built up now over really since January, February, this, this fear, this panic, this sense of hopelessness, this sense of loss of power, um, you know, being cooped up in your residence for a long period of time and feeling as though things are out of control and you can't control them. You know, there, there are forces at work that, that you simply have no control over. 
and then suddenly you're allowed to go out into the streets and, and protest, mm, irrespective of the, you know, the rights or wrongs of that, the sense of that, you know, given that we are in a pan pandemic. But all of this is sort of built into this, this sort of um, conflagration of passion and outpouring of grief and emotion and all sorts of things. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, we can get on later to what I'm doing right now with this film and so forth. But, but, but I've, I've gone back to all of the people that I interviewed and I've done recent Zoom interviews with them to talk about fear in the current climate. Yeah. Um, and one of the questions that I've asked everybody is what, what's happening on a, an esoteric level here? What, yeah. what, is, what is happening in the larger sphere of things. Mm -hmm. And most of the people have come back and said, this is a reset, it's a reboot, it's a realignment, it's a recalibration of energies which had gone awry. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been bad actors, we've been bad participants, we've been bad residents of planet Earth. James Van Prague, who I interviewed in PGS and now is in the Facing Fear film, uh, was one of America's great psychics. James talked about um, planetary karma. That's a term that I hadn't heard before. He talked about the planet having karma and, and, and karma not being uh, retributive. A lot of people think that karma is a process of retribution. It's not. It's a process of rebalancing. And he said the earth is rebalancing. Absolutely. Look, absolutely. On a personal level and on a collective level, look, as we go, as you've done, you've gone through your transformation. And I didn't... Yeah, going through it, Karen. It's not finished there. Go through it. Well, yeah. yeah. Once I'm a pure ball of white light, then I'll fi figure that I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, well, that's many, a ways off, I'm telling you. <laughs> there's many levels of transformation. You know, there's earth transformation and then there's other different dimensions where we go through transformation in those, you know, like there's so many different experiences we can have transformational experiences on. But, you know, I didn't realise how huge the transformation was until I heard you say that, you know, with, with Jennifer, because it was a question I had thought about. Was Jennifer into spirituality before you started making PGS and, and you answered that. So can I, can I just interrupt there for a second? Yeah. She, she was, she was against me making the film. Really? Mm, yeah. She was violent, violently against me making the film. She said, I didn't have a bloody clue. I didn't know <laughs> what I was talking about. I'd make an absolute mess of it. And, <laughs> and, and she, <laughs> our, our company is called BJ Films, Bill and Jennifer, you know, so I always, I always um, make decisions, major decisions about what we're going to do in conjunction with her, of course. Yeah. And she was adamant that I should not make the film. And it's kind of like a test, Karen, you know, when I, I listen to Jennifer, and, you know, she's, she's a much wiser person than me, a much smarter person than me. <laughs> and... Um, and when she says something like that, I do listen to her, but I just, I just have this absolute inexplicable need to make the film. Yeah. And I went against her and I just started making it. I mean, you know, we talked about the series of very mystic things that happened prior to my making the film, you know, which gave me a very strong pointer towards making it. But, but no, she, <laughs> she was against me making the film at the start. Mm. For people that haven't watched the show before, it was, uh, was it, it was in the eighties, wasn't it? You want to just go over what happened to you? The mystical thing that sort of you wrapped the, the, the film around what, what happened? To well, you? there was that, but um, what happened was what started it all was I was uh, making a thriller in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, a big international thriller. Um, and I had to go to the air airport early one morning to do a casting session. And as I was driving to the airport, it was dark before dawn. I heard a voice which said, slow down. 
Uh, I had a green light up ahead. I was actually running late for my flight. I wanted to speed up, if anything. I ignored it, thinking that that's just, you know, I haven't had enough coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's just crazy. Um, the voice came in a second time. I did slow down. Then a huge truck ran a red light, narrowly, narrowly missing me. Had I not slowed down and listened to that voice, I would have been killed. And that's what prompted the, the story. But what, what happened was that I tried for many, many years to get the film made in the same way that I'd made my other films. I'm quite experienced at raising money and putting a film together, but I could not get any traction at all with this film. And after pretty much 10 years of struggling and trying and spending a lot of money attending international markets and talking to sales agents and distributors and everything, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get any interest in making the film. I had this dream. I, it was, I'd actually gone to bed that night. Have I told you this story or not? No, no. I'd gone to, after, literally after about 10 years and I was at the point of real frustration because I knew it was going to be a good film, but I just couldn't find a way to make it. And I said to myself that particular night, I've got to make a decision in the morning whether or not I proceed with it or I, I let it go because it was taking out too much of, of my time. It was eating, needing money. Um, yeah. And I wasn't getting anywhere. Anyway, that particular night I had this dream that um, was very clear in its instruction for me to make the film but that I wasn't to wait for the money and the big crews and so forth that I needed, that I'd had for previous films. I had to just go out and make it, even if that meant nickel and diming it and doing it on an absolute shoestring, and, but I had to do it immediately. Anyway, I woke up out of that dream in the middle of the night. I looked across at the um, clock on my bedside table and it was 4.44 in the morning. <laughs> So thought, that's weird. You know, I, I literally sort of sat bolt upright with this very clear imprint in my mind that this, this dream said, you've got to make this movie and this is the way you've got to do it. I look at the clock, it's 4.44. So I immediately went for my iPad, which I had by the side of my bed, and I Googled what does 4.44 mean? And up came um, Dorian Virtue, in fact saying that it was, a, it was a very powerful message from my spirit guides and masters telling me that I had to proceed with my endeavour, that if I trusted my intuition, then it would all turn out to be successful, wow. and that my archangels and guides and masters would, would protect me and guide me through my journey, but that it was something that I had to do. Well, you and couldn't get clear of that. It was that dream combined with... 444 combined with finding out what 444 meant that was the trigger for me to make the film. Mm. And I went back to sleep and then I woke up a few hours later and went out and bought a camera and bought some sound gear and booked tickets to India because that's where I felt that I needed to start. And I started the film. Um, and then one thing led to another and investment came on board. And, but I only gave myself one rule in the making of the film. That was that I had to put aside my logic and I had to make the film intuitively. And that was a huge, huge lesson for me because the art of filmmaking is the art of rational, logical thinking. You know, you've got to plan ahead. You've got to schedule. You've got to... Um, know what you're going to do beforehand, all of those things. It's anti-intuition. <laughs> um, I, I decided that I would just let all that go and that I would just follow my intuitive uh, nudges and it led me to people like Carolyn Mace and James Van Praag and Lee Carroll and others. Michael Tamora, Paul Selig, uh, mm -hmm. so many. James Ovard, Judith Olof, um, Dean Radin. Yeah. All these, all these so extraordinary many. people. People so said many. to me later, they said, how did you get these people? This is sort of like the who's who of intuition. I, I had no idea. I didn't know who Carolyn Mace was before I rang her up. 
I'd never heard of James Van Pride before I went round to his place and did the interview with him. Well, you wouldn't, being a journalist in the mainstream yeah. media, you just yeah, wouldn't. These people, these people never came into my sphere at all. Yeah. I know I, there are rock stars in the spiritual world and when I speak with my kind of mainstream friends, and I say people like, um, you know, Hay House, um, I've gone blank on her name now, um, who started Hay House. Louise Hay. Oh, Louise Hay. How can I go blank on your name? Sorry, Louise. Uh, who's like a rock star in my books. I say, hey, you know who she is. Hey, and they go, hey, no. We've got, we've got to mark this moment. Isn't this funny? Here I am, me telling you that it's Louise Hay. How, how crazy is that? <laughs> yes. <I know>. what, a, <laughs> what a turnaround is that, hey? I know. Well, now you're well-versed in this world. But really the film was your spiritual awakening. It was your spiritual awakening, even though your wife didn't manage to do it. Um, how did you get Jennifer on board? I mean, how did you convince her that you were going to make it? I guess you just did it and she had to come on board. I just, I just did it. And, you know, she, she saw, she, it, it wasn't an immediate thing, I've got to say. It was a very progressive um, sort of unfolding because I did approach the whole thing. Look, I, I said that I would approach it with an open mind, but um, but I was still sceptical, you know, and it wasn't until really about halfway through the filming process, about a year and a half or maybe two years into filming, that I really kind of did a big switcheroo. I mean, you can't interview people like Paul Selig, James Van Praag, Carolyn Mace, these people, and not be absolutely impacted by what they do, what they say. I mean, if you approach it like, if you approach with an absolutely closed mind, like, a, like an investigative hard-nosed reporter, mm -hmm. then you, it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that. I mm -hmm. thought, if, okay, if I'm going to make this film and if I've got to be, if I'm going to be true to the 444, <laughs> then I have to, I have to keep an open mind and, and, and allow myself to entertain the prospect that what they're saying is actually true. Which was actually you facing your fear. Because I think for men too, who are in the mainstream world, the corporate world, um, business as usual, there is this huge fear of looking like an idiot, like looking like you're stupid. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to talk about God or angels or spirit guides, I think that all my mainstream friends are the same. You know, they've been vilifying me for years, telling me that what I believe in is crap. They've now decided, I haven't seen them all for a few years, that I'm just too woo-woo for them. Mm -hmm. And so they don't even want to know about me anymore, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I, there's a couple that I ring every now and then just to make sure they're still alive. But it, it's kind of, it's, it is a fear thing, isn't it? It's like, I can't mm -hmm. associate with you because it's going to make me look stupid. Like, that's a fear. Well, I'll tell you something, and I'm not sure that I mentioned this last time or not, um, but I was never meant to be in the film. Um, yes, you did mention that last time, and I was so pleased you put yourself in the film. But, yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, for that very reason, because I knew that if... There were two things that I knew that if I put myself in the film would happen. And they have happened. One is that I would declare myself, I would have to declare myself a changed person who believes in spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And I would, having done that, it's a place I could never step back from. I, I couldn't unsay what I had said in the film. Yeah. And at the end, if you remember, I say, um, I can't rem mem remember my exact words now, but I, I say I've become an aspect of divine energy, which I believe we all are. All of us yeah. are. Those well, I don't know if you that. became that, but you realised that you are that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and that, that was inspired through Paul, wasn't it? Paul's work. It was, absolutely mm. through Paul's, Paul Selig's work, yeah. In fact, I was swapping emails with Paul this morning. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm very fortunate and these people have become friends. But um, I was terrified of actually, somebody called it coming out of the spiritual closet. Closet. Yeah. I was ter terrified of that, of actually standing beside my film and saying, this is me. Mm. And so I did 
quite a few cuts of the film without me in it. I showed it to people and everybody said, well, what about you? What about your story? We're interested in that and that will help inform the bigger story. And so finally I did put myself in it, but it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to do. And it was fear, absolute fear. You know, Karen, I tell you something. One of the things that um, one of the people said to me in the making of this film, who studied fear a lot, said, the biggest fear is the fear of what other people will think of you. It's really, really interesting. And that stops so much of our, our growth and our potential. The fear of what other people think of you. And that was the fear that was holding me back. Yeah. Yeah. If you can overcome that fear, suddenly, suddenly the whole world opens up to you. You feel so liberated. You feel so free. Absolutely. You know, because you can do anything. Nothing's holding you back. Absolutely. Anything that's holding you back is your own limitation. And if you can rid yourself of that fear, then, my God, the world is an extraordinary place. The world is an extraordinary place. Um, there's so many things going on in my head. It kind of all boils down to both with Belinda and with um, another beautiful young man I had on the show, Aaron Abke, we talk about, you know, as, as someone who works with people and I work with subconscious thought forms, I nailed it down to a, just like a handful of thought forms that if you engage in them, your whole life is a mess. Like it's all, all the fears like live on top of just a couple of thoughts. And then he said that the Course in Miracles kind of brings it down to one thought, actually, not just a couple. And I was thinking fear of unworthiness, fear of lack, fear of death. But he said there's actually only one thought that if you pull that thought, everything tumbles, my words, not his. And that is the la fear of lack. So mm. when you look at lack, mm. when you look at the fear of what other people say, it comes down to I'll have lack of friends, lack of respect, mm. lack of I won't get a job, lack of money. It actually all boils down to lack. Mm. So that fear of lack is the, is the, you know, the number one pin under that, that underrides every other, uh, other fear. Well, and that, that all stems back to, as you say, um, a fear of, uh, lack of self-esteem, yep. uh, uh, a lack of worthiness. Lack of worthiness. And if you go to Paul's work, which I believe and other people believe as well, is is the new Course in Miracles. That's how his work has been. Oh, I didn't know that. Welcomed. Yeah, and it is, I think. Paul's work is extraordinary. I I had a great conversation with him recently, which you must listen to because. I've never, I've never seen him more relaxed and more jovial, actually, because Paul's pretty serious and he hates doing interviews. Yeah. Is he <laughs> in, in Maui at the time? Yeah, he's in Maui. And, he's been much more relaxed since he's been in Maui. Yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago. We had a ball. But in the first conversation I had with Paul, Paul Selleck, this is for people who don't know, I remember he said to me, I had to come out of the closet twice, first as a gay man and then as a you know, spiritual channel. Mm. And he said um, coming out of the spiritual channel closet was actually a lot harder than coming out as a gay man. I thought that was hilarious. Mm. So, yeah, this fear of what people think of you, exactly. I, I think that um, when, you know, so many people are wanting to um, develop their intuition or their psychic abilities and if you rid yourself of that fear they all come online they all just like light up yeah. it just lights up yeah. it just lights up because that's that fear of what if i get it wrong what if i'm wrong what if uh, what will people think of me what if i look stupid yeah. all that is just in the way of our natural ability to be intuitive because we're born intuitive beings and then we get taught out of it it's not yeah. something we need to learn it's just something we need to remember right yeah. absolutely right and Karen, I, I've got to say, Karen May said something to me really interesting. She didn't say it on camera, but, um, but she said it to me off camera. She, she said, the most intuitive people she knows are criminals. Really? Yeah. And she said, and, and she said of those, the, the ones, the best criminals use their intuition the best. And it got me thinking, and I, I started to see all these courses online, you know, teaching people intuition and how complicated they are and so forth. Mm. And I thought, I thought back to what Callan had said, I thought none of these <laughs> intuitive criminals have done any courses mm -hmm. on intuition, I'm sure. 
you know, but um, but they have learned to trust those intuitive impulses that have you know, made them what they are. Um, of course, with spirit, there's no judgment, you know, so whether somebody uses their intuition for good or bad is, um, there's no judgment there. But, but invariably, source leads you to the right place. Absolutely. You know, I used to teach this. And when I was in my 30s, I used to teach a healing course where I would get people connected to their spirit guides and teach them about their intuition. We used to go into the Akash and read the Akashic records and go into our past lives and look inside the body and become medical intuitives. I used to teach all this. Mm. But I don't teach it anymore. I, and I could make a lot more money if I did because I could really draw it out. <laughs> Mm. but I have a little online group and it's like nothing to hardly anything to join and they're always saying to me should I do a course in how to you know meet my spirit guides and I'm like no <laughs> you could do a course you could pay hundreds of dollars you could pay thousands of dollars you could do it for weeks all you have to do is move your fear out of the way mm. you just have to move your doubt out of the way and you got it mm. and uh, it's not a really good business plan to do this but it's a much better business plan to teach people how to do it as you say all these courses but it's so simple isn't it it's just so simple yeah and people love to complicate things and i think people um, love to complicate things yeah. i think you know if you're going to charge 500 bucks for a course or something it needs to be complicated yeah um, exactly exactly as i say I, I could do it the other way and make a lot more money i have a young woman in my group who had a session with me I, I always always wanted to know about my guide. So we took her there, bang, she's there, and now she's channeling. And she said, all that happened was that I gave myself permission. You allowed me to give myself permission. That's all that happened. Yeah, yeah and, and she's channeling the most exalted, like she's kind of like, you know, Paul. She's channeling this exalted wisdom now. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it was just that decision, that permission decision, just that mm. little tweak. It's just a little tweak that we give ourselves permission to be who we know we are yeah. and uh, it's just moving that fear out of the way it's um mm -hmm. so for you let's look at how you've moved your fear out of the way you said that you stood up and said to a group of people that you don't have any fear anymore or you think you don't have as much fear how did you move your fear out of the way especially when you came out of the spiritual closet mm. in the film well i think um a couple of things happen. I mean, and the, once again, I'm influenced by Paul's work in saying this, but the notion that each of us is has Christ energy, um, and that because of that, we can't judge anyone else because in doing that, we're judging Christ energy. You can't do that. Uh, it's beyond judgment. And so once you get to that place, then that drops away a lot of fear because no one can hurt you. I mean, you, you, you're bulletproof because you're transparent. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Byron Katie, one of my favourite teachers, says, um, you can't hurt me, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> How beautifully put. Only, uh, I'm the only one that can hurt me. She talks about, she used to go, years ago, she used to go into jails and talk to prisoners in jail. And she was doing a talk in a, in a jail and this guy piped up and said, yeah, full of shit, lady. And she goes, really? Tell me more. And she, he goes, you're ugly. You're so ugly. And so she gets off the stage and goes into the audience and says, you seem to know a lot about me. Tell me more. And he starts abusing her and saying what's with the gray hair you know like you why don't you dye your hair you look so old and anyway it's this hilarious story and she just keeps saying to him well when you get out of here maybe you could get a job as a stylist you seem to be you seem to know a lot about styling. she just has this hilarious conversation hilarious conversation with someone who's ridiculing her and judging her and mm -hmm. and because she doesn't engage in fear it just it just becomes this hilarious communication Mm. And there was a lot of laughter and a lot of love and he completely changed his tune because she didn't take on anything he said as truth. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, she didn't react to his energy with, with more negative energy. What she did was she, um, she, uh, she diffused it. 
Yeah, um, one of the things that she says that I love, uh, you know, maybe you can get her in her document. I, I've been trying for like 10 years to get her on the show and she's never said yes. Who's this? Um, Byron Katie. And mm. she says that defence is the first act of war. So as soon as you defend yourself, now you're at war. Mm. And it's one of the things I talk about all the time because defence is actually a fear. Is actually fear. Mm. Mm. When you know that nobody can hurt you, then you don't need to defend mm. yourself. Mm. So when you are defending yourself, you are in your fear, something that we can learn mm. from. Mm. Um, if we're in defence, we're engaging in some fearful thoughts and what is it that I'm scared of? Why am I defending myself? I'm not talking about defending yourself against someone who's trying to rob you or stab you, I'm like in a conversation, in an argument. Yeah. That's very true. So who else have you chatted with for your next film on fear? Any new people? Are you putting the same um, people in the film or have you got new well, ones? Some are. Uh, um, with this one, I've gone a little bit more science-based. Um, one of the really, um, you know, interview. I mean, one of, one of the really interesting people is uh, a former retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Rangers, an elite uh, combat veteran. He left the army and then became a highly paid mercenary, wow. and so and worked in the Middle East and so forth. And so it was very interesting to talk to him about fear from a combat situation. And what, uh, what he did, I, I asked him, you know, I asked him to talk through those, those times when he faced very real fear and what he did. And how he, how he dealt with his fear was he first controlled his physical manifestations of fear. He controlled his breathing. He controlled his heartbeat. He controlled, um, you know, his trembling. And... In controlling that, then the mind followed. Wow. Which was really interesting because most people go for the mind first and then hope that the body will follow. But he went to the body first and then hoped that the mind would follow and invariably it did. That's interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. It's fascinating. Something that oh, years ago when I was in my 30s, I did Anthony Robbins, you know, I went to Maui and did an Anthony Robbins thing. And he spoke about that too, controlling your physicalness in order to control your state he would say you know change your posture yeah. your posture yeah. and he, and uh um i'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking back to giving birth actually because they teach you in giving birth to, to control your breathing yeah. uh, you know like and to actually control those physical because giving birth is scary you know yeah. it's scary everybody tells you horror stories poor young women Mm. Uh, they're about to have a baby and then everyone will come to them and tell them they're birthing horror stories and put them in complete fear. Mm. <laughs> like, I'm going to squeeze this watermelon <laughs> out of my body and they're in fear. So, uh, yeah, so it's controlling that fear during the birthing process and, and what Lamar's classes do. They give you all these physical things to do mm. in order to control your fear. One of the other people I spoke to was, um, he's a very famous psychologist. His name is... Dr. Richard Schwartz, Dick Schwartz. Um, he's an adjunct professor at um, Harvard, but he is, um, he's known for uh, creating a system to deal with trauma called the internal family systems. And essentially what the internal family systems is, is it, um, it says that we have within us various parts I mean, fear can be a part, um, um, jealousy can be a part, rage can be a part. They're all various parts. How he came about this was that um, he, he was, uh, as a clinical psychologist, he did a lot of work with um, families, working out uh, tr trauma and issues with families. And he'd sit around at a dinner table and he'd talk to the whole family and realise that each family had a, a particular characteristic if you like and then he started to think well maybe all of the various issues that we have inside us can be can be parts themselves and so he developed this process of dealing with trauma by actually addressing the various parts finding the parts in your in your body and addressing them and then personalizing them making them into people 
so fear can be a part, but there, there can be several aspects to fear. There can be fear of loss of income or fear of um, health, uh, losing your health or something. So what he does is he works with people to find those parts in their body that represent those particular fears. And then he encourages the person then to actually start up conversations with them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, say, good morning, my fear of getting old part. How are you this morning? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it works. You know, his, his internal family systems process has been taken up by psychologists all over the world. Wow. Very, very successful. Um, and I found that really interesting. It's so interesting. You know, Phil. You've just reiterated a, a, a short film, a short talk that I put out saying almost exactly the same thing, but ca- calling it pain. You know, when you have pain in your body, instead mm. of trying to resist it, talk to your pain mm. and say, hi, hello, old friend. How are you? What are you trying to communicate with me? And, and let it lead you where it wants to go because it's just some resistance that you have in it. But don't resist the resistance. Friend it. Love it. Love it. It all comes down to love, really. For, well, what is friendship but love? Mm. So can we be friendly with our pain or our fear or our anger? Can mm. we love it? Mm. I love it. You know, it's interesting you say that because one of the reasons why I called the film Facing Fear, mm-hmm. and in fact, you might remember in PGS, I had the five steps to accessing your intuition being stop, listen, ask, trust, and follow. Well, I've come up with the five F's of fear. Uh-huh. Um, feel it, find it, face it, friend it, and free it. There you go. Um, and that's essentially what you're saying, is you, you need to acknowledge that fear is an asset that it's um, a mechanism that, in fact, is trying to help you. Mm -hmm. It's warning you of danger or something that's untoward that you need to deal with. Mm -hmm. You need to find that fear. You need to feel it and understand exactly what it is and what it's trying to tell you. You need to face it. Then you need to friend it. And some people think that, talk about living without fear, you can't live without fear. Um, You know, I, 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 um, you can free it and free its hold on you, but you can't ever get rid of it. Mm-hmm. This whole thing about uh, what Franklin D. Roosevelt said, the only thing you need to fear is fear itself. Well, mm-hmm. I've come to realise that that, in fact, is not true. You, you don't need to fear fear. In fact, you need to friend fear, as you say, mm-hmm. because it is an aspect of you that is trying to help you, mm-hmm. and you need to understand what it is, what signals it's giving you, in the same way that intuition is. And that's exactly the same thing. You need to be able to be, become so self-aware of those things that are trying to help you that you can understand them for what they truly are, and mm. that is their assets. Mm. It's all happening for me, not to me, including mm. fear. Mm. What was it that I was talking to? It was, it was Paul, actually. Paul Selleck said that... F- you know, we talked about everything is God. There's nothing that is not God. And he mm. said, fear is God itself. You know, fear mm. is God as well. Mm. It's just fear is forgotten that it's God. <laughs> but mm. it's all part of God too. Yeah. Mm. But it, yeah, it all comes down to your emotional guidance system being that every emotion you have is just communicating something to you about you, mm. about a belief that you have. Mm. Fear is just a, a, an emotion that's communicating something that, that you hold as a, as a, as a truth. So, so Byron says with her work uh, about stressful thoughts is when she had her epiphany about 35 years ago, she had this experience of waking up uh, and, and I say she woke up dead because she woke up in this altered state where she didn't feel attached to anything. It's a bit like having a near death experience, but being in the body and having no fear, and she realized that all her suffering was because of one thing, and that was because she believed her stressful thoughts. And I remember when Oprah said to her, so you mean to say you haven't had, because Oprah interviewed her years ago, 
you haven't had a stressful thought for 25 years? And she said, oh, no, I've had millions of them. I just don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Isn't that perfect? So yeah. also you've, you had an extraordinary experience with Michael Tamora, a healing. Do you want to tell us about that when you met him for the film Intuition mm -hmm. and what happened? Well, I talked earlier about how it was about halfway through the filming that things changed for me. Mm. And that was my meeting with uh, Michael. I, in fact, had just finished the interview with James Van Prague and James said, where, where are you going next? And I said, well, I'm thinking of going to Mount Shasta because I hear it's a spiritual place and maybe I can bump into somebody there who's spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how I made the film, literally. Um, and he said, well, if you go, go to Manchester, you've really got to see Michael Tour. He's one of the country's best psychic healers. And he's a good friend of mine. So I called up Michael and we, we arranged to meet. Now, during this period, I had had a chronic cough. I actually picked I walked the uh, Portuguese Camino in... Um, in um, Portugal and Spain, and I developed a cough there which hadn't gone away. It had hung around for about literally 12 months or more, and it was getting worse. I'd, I'm not somebody who goes to the doctor readily, but I went to the doctor several times, got various antibiotics, none of them worked, and I was really starting to get quite worried about it. I'd started the filming with this cough, I was traveling with the camera crew and, um, and they were really quite concerned. I had picked up in Europe a, a natural product that stopped the coughing for about three hours. It didn't fix the cough, but it stopped the, stopped the coughing. And so when I met with M Michael for the first time to do the interview, I'd had one of, these, um, one of these little things that had stopped the coughing. What I hadn't told him was that the previous night, my coughing had got so bad at one o'clock in the morning, I'd woken up, I'd woken up at one o'clock in the morning with his coughing fit. I put the sheet over my mouth to try and stifle the coughs, not, not to wake up Jennifer. I woke up that morning, the morning of the interview, and the sheet was covered in blood. That, that, that freaked me out because that's the first time that had happened. Anyway, I took one of these little tablet things to stop the coughing and I, I arrived at Michael's place. He took one look at me and he said, you need a healing. And so he sat me down, he, he, he sat about quite a distance away from me, about eight feet or so. And while the crew was setting up to do the interview, he did this healing and he moved his hands and felt my energies. I mean, all, all this stuff I wasn't familiar with at the time. Uh, mm. I was at this point really quite skeptical because yeah. um, I, nothing had cleared this cough there was nothing that none of the none of the drugs none of the doctors nothing had cleared this cough and he didn't even know that i had a cough but he just said i needed a healing just taking one look at me anyway he he put himself into this zone and his eyes went all sort of fluttery crazy and everything and then he his eyes snapped open and he described in great detail as though she was in the room standing beside me, this woman that I had a relationship with before I'd met Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't ended well. And she, she was, um, and he, he described her in not, not sort of in ways where he's groping for detail or anything like that. He described her vividly and sort of about her so that, yeah. Which I found a bit freaky to be quite frank. And, um, and he said, she's still angry with you. And I said, yeah, that'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, she has her hands around your throat and she's trying to strangle you. Would you like me to release her? And I said, yeah, please. <laughs> so he did that. And then he went back into his place and we put his hands around everything and his eyes opened up again suddenly. And then he described this scene where I was in... Um, I was on this trellis in stocks, you know, in the middle of this square, this medieval village square, and my throat had been cut, but in a way that I was bleeding slowly and dying slowly. Mm. And evidently I'd been speaking out against the church, and the church had 
had done this, the churchmen had done this, had had, um, put me in the middle of the square to stop me uh, as an example for other people not to speak out against the church. And once again, Paul said, would you, would you like me to heal this? Mm. Sorry, Michael, Michael said, yes, would you like me to heal this? And I, I said, yeah, please. Uh, which, which, and he did his thing with his hands again. And, and then we started the interview. Anyway, it didn't occur to me until probably five or six hours later, we were having just about to have dinner. And the cameraman said, you haven't coughed. And literally to that day, I haven't coughed since, Karen. I know. Well, you're so... That, I've got to say, that was a turning point for me because... Mm-hmm. And, and the cameraman, who was even more sceptic than me, absolutely couldn't believe it. Right. Um, because all through the trip, we'd been, I'd been coughing and he'd been getting more and more concerned about me. Mm-hmm. But really from... And I can't, I mean, this was a major turning point for me, you know, because I was witness to this firsthand. Michael told me later, and we became friends after that, he told me later that he had had a near-death experience where he had been given the option of staying or going back and reincarnating and and continuing his life. Mm -hmm. But his counsel, his spirit counsel, had told him that the one condition was that he didn't do any more healings. Mm, that all I he did was, was teach. I was going to say, you're so lucky to have had a healing from Michael. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. Because yeah. he and doesn't. He said that the, the message he got before I came was that he was to do a healing on me because he saw me as a communicator <laughs> and that I needed to be convinced that this stuff worked. There you go. Mm. And I, you know, look, prior to that, I'd, I'd sort of, I'd been kind of wavering, you know, as to whether to believe this stuff or not. But then experiencing it firsthand, as I did, that, that just swung it for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I came back to Australia and people, had, people that I knew, friends of mine, couldn't believe that I wasn't coughing because before leaving... I couldn't have a conversation on the phone for somebody for more than a minute or two minutes and then I'd have to break up and have it go into a coughing pit. Yeah. You know, so, so Michael was the turning point for me. Well, look at the perfection. I just want to showcase the perfection. The fact that the cough occurred around that time, mm. which was kind of like your fear coming up, like that fear that we carry from past lives and linear fear, uh, sorry, um, our ancestral fear and... We, we carry so many thought forms from so many areas. Mm. It's kind of sitting there in your subconscious. Mm. It's become available to you through a cough. Mm. Uh, and then you go and meet Michael and he has the ability to show it to you through a past life ex- and, and a this life, you know, uh, experience and a past life experience mm. to show you that fear, if you like, mm. and um, and then to release it for you to to give you an experience of how consciousness works. It's just so perfect. And what's even more perfect was when I was talking to you last time on the show, you just mentioned, you didn't actually talk about Michael at all. You just said he was extraordinary and he, uh, he was a big influence on you. That's all you said, just one little tiny sentence. Mm. And I picked up on that. Mm. Of all the people that you spoke with, I'm like, I need to look at Michael Tamora and I contacted him and put him on the show. He's been on the show four times. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He's Love been in our inner sanctum as a guest teacher and... and a sweet fellow. Yeah. And I, the first t- show I did with him, I recognised him as one of my teachers in spirit. Yeah. So I, because I'm sitting here and I've got all these spirits sitting here they've pulled up chairs you know listening there was a friend of mine who had died who came to me in the morning i'm in the shower and i'm thinking about her and i'm thinking what am i thinking about her karen her name was and then as i'm talking to michael i see that she's sitting there with all these other spirits listening to michael teach you know me on zoom and i'm like you're not just teaching us in the physical you're actually teaching in the um non-physical realms as well and he goes yeah yeah i teach in all these other realms mm-hmm. and i said yes a whole mass of spirits here like listening to what you've got to say mm-hmm. extraordinary man mm-hmm. extraordinary man so i have to thank you for that for um 
you introduced me to him. Yeah. Oh, no, it was uh, your cleverness to pick up on that, that one thing that I said about Michael. Intuition, darling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, it comes with the right time as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's extraordinary, extraordinary. Yeah. And I'd love to get him down under. We're going to get him down under you and I one day. Well, he's, he's wanting to come to Australia and I think mm. you have um, a big following here. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, big. I mean, we've discussed like his level of uh, conversation is not that sort of mass level. Mind you, nor is Paul, but Paul seems to draw a crowd. He definitely draws a crowd, which is very exciting actually for someone who's been doing this for so many years. To see people like um, Paul Selleck drawing these big crowds, it makes me, mm. makes me happy. I think mm. that there are people interested in his work. You know, the funny thing is that when I first, um, how I met Paul was that um, I had finished filming PGS, but I'd become quite interested in the process of channeling. And I was on Amazon and I Googled channels, no books on channeling. And up came Paul's book, The Book of Mastery, in fact, his fourth book. And you know, you know what it is, you know, you immediately, you know, I've got to read this book. So I read the book, and then I went back to book one and read all the books up to the Book of Mastery, because that's where he'd written to at that point. And I said to Jennifer, we've got to go to New York and we've got to interview this guy. And, and so strangely, we did the interview with him the day that Trump got elected. Wow. Or the day after Trump was elected. So um, the election day was the previous day and the announcement that he had become president was on the day that, wow. that we interviewed Paul. Um, but Paul was so self-deprecating and he said, he's, I remember him saying to me, you know, you've got all of these amazing people in your film. I don't feel like I've got the right to be in amongst their ranks. Mm -hmm. And I just laughed and I said, well, believe me, you do. And, and you know what? You, you're going to be as big as any of the big, big names we've got here, if not more so. And the thing about Paul, as you know, is that he is... Um, He's a reluctant prophet, is how I call him. Look, I discussed this with him in length in the last conversation. And what did he say? It's a, it's a fear, but here's, this is how spirit works. This is the perfection and the beauty of how everything serves us. You know, like fear serves us as much as anything else serves us. It's all serving us. Mm. So I had this aha moment after I got off the conversation because... If you look at the law, what you resist persists, like what you push against expands. Like when you give your focus and attention to something, you expand on it. Whether you're funneling fear into it or funneling love into it, you're expanding. Mm. So his fear is, and he said it in his words, something like, the last thing I would want is to be known as the channeler with a capital T, S H C. You know, I don't want to be somebody's guru. I'm nobody's guru. That's, the, that's like his biggest fear. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the last thing he'd want is mm -hmm. to be known as the channeler. So he says, you know, because I said to him, you're always saying, I'm just the radio. I'm just this. I'm just this. I'm just that. Mm -hmm. And then I gave him my perspective on how he's not just the radio. And interestingly enough, it's the same perspective you have about mm -hmm. his work you know working with words and how the mm. the guidance uses his brain to bring through the information with such beautiful poetic words and the words that he chooses and um, what i find interesting karen is that um spirit chooses people and often it chooses people with communication skills exactly um i mean you look at lee Carroll. lee Carroll was an audio engineer you know, before he started channeling cryo mm -hmm. and now one of the ways that cryo's message gets out is through these extraordinary audio tapes mp mp3s that he's got on his website which goes right the way back to probably around about the time jennifer started around about early 2000 mm. if you look at paul he was a dramaturg 
and uh, he taught um, at NYU. He taught um, literature and and um, uh, theatre. Um, you know, so so spirit chooses these people that have skills that can get a message out. Well, I wouldn't say it that way. Spirit chose them before they were born, and then they developed those skills so that they could get a message out. <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, they had that yeah, agreement. Yeah, absolutely right. They yep. had that agreement before coming in into the earth experience. And so, and then again, so we had an agreement to become a communicator of exalted wisdom mm -hmm. and we're directed in certain areas of life where we can sharpen our skills so that spirit can use the mind and the words and the vocab in order mm. to bring a message. But again, we have free choice to say, no, I'm going to sit on the couch, watch Netflix and eat ice cream. I mean, mm. we've, we, you know, I'm not going to go to university and become, you know, a teacher in drama and script writing and all that sort of stuff. So we still have free choice, but uh, we're directed the whole time. So spirit's chosen us before it happened but then it's up mm. to us and that's where we play that part it's up to us to do the work like you for some reason you didn't become a doctor you became a journalist mm. and that journalism gave you some skills to get the message out through making for interviewing people and making documentaries and so it was all arranged before we even got here <laughs> it was all yeah, arranged no, 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 no. yeah Free, free will and choice does kick in though. And when you look back on your life, there are many times when you could have gone the other way. Um, and Paul still rails against, you know, against his chosen path. Well, this is the perfection of it. So as I got off the last interview with him, I thought his resistance to being the channeler is creating him. I have never seen a person that channels exalted wisdom have such a meteoric rise to notoriety as Paul. I've never seen it. And I've been doing this for 35 odd years. You know, I've been showcasing teachers and teaching myself. And like, I've seen a lot of people come and go. Well, yeah. not go, but well, a few have gone, like left the planet. But um, I've never seen anything that, like, that happened. But his, his huge resistance to not being the channeler with a capital T has actually created him as the channeler because what you resist persists. So there is this yeah. unbelievable perfection in his resistance to it is creating exactly what he doesn't want and getting the message out there. Do, do you see how it all works? Like the beauty well, and the perfection of it all. Because people, people, people get the authenticity. Yeah. Um, it's, something, it's something that... Um, and equally, people people get fakes as well. Yeah, you know they get people who who um, are wanting it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but let's not forget the work, and that is that his work, the work of Michael Turner and James Van Prague and these people, is extraordinary, and it can't be explained in logical, rational ways. And I try and tell people. And I use Paul as an example in the way he works with Victoria, but now he's doing live, live stream channelings, of course. But um, when he started off, he would dictate, and Victoria and Berkeley on the other side of the country would transcribe what he had channeled. And when you go back and you look at the books, which haven't been doctored in any way, I mean, his guides, Paul's guides, are absolutely rabid about the fact that no words should be changed. Mm. When you look at the density of thought, complexity and sophistication of thought behind those words, I mean, you know, I said I've been swapping emails with Paul this morning and he's got a little, and it's a signature thing on the bottom, he's got a, an extract from I Am The Word, which I've read, I think I've read that book twice now, but I'd forgotten this extract that had to do with uh, the ascension of light. And I was just looking at that one sentence and thinking, my God, in that one sentence, there is such extraordinary wisdom. Now, how can you explain that to people? I mean, if you sat down and tried to write that, you couldn't what, write that. What was the sentence? I can't remember. If you, if you go to his email, it, it's at the bottom. Oh, okay. um, do you want me to pull it up now? Yeah, let's pull it up. Found it. 
Mm -hmm. So here's what he's got in his, um, what Paul Selig has got in his um, signature block at the end of his email. Quote, you are the first in a generation of conscious beings coming into form and you will make it possible for those that follow to, more, to exist more easily in the higher frequencies that are now available. This is a gift, but this is a massive change. It's a tidal wave of light ascending into you as you ascend into it. And that's from I Am The Word. And I was, I was looking at that this morning. I was joking with Paul that, uh, you know, perhaps he's going to live in Maui for good now and give up New York. And um, I thought the same thing. <laughs> I was looking at that, that sentence this morning and just marvelling, number one, at how right it is and what's happening right at this moment. And you talked before about that. You mentioned that before. But also I was just, I was just thinking about the complexity of ideas and thought and the use of words. And... Mm. If you tried to write that, it would probably take some time to write that. Or, but what he does is he channels this. And sentences, uh, I mean, you read his books, the, the, the sophistication of ideas is impossible to memorise and then recant later on. You can't mm. do it. Where does this well, stuff come from? I mean, it's, it's got to come from elsewhere. One of the questions I asked my, my group, my online group, to because um, they're all big fans of his work, to, um, to write some question down. And one of the girls <laughs> said, how can you be so resistant and still bring through such amazing, you know, channel? <laughs> and, and what Paul said was because of the agreement that he had with his guides. So, you know, when we talk about learning intuition and we talk about letting go of fear and you know, tapping into our guidance system or our guidance, whether it be our spirit guides or our galactic guides or a higher self or, you know, whoever you want to talk to, you've got to like let go of that resistance and that fear. And yet Paul hasn't let go of it and, and he can channel. It's like, how can you do that? And he just said, because of the arrangement that he had with them, mm. it just they just move. It's like they're not going to wait for him to do the work. They just move him out of the way. They, as he said, they just put him in the back seat. And mm. when he does interfere, he'll say, they'll say, Paul is interfering with the transmission. Please move back. <laughs> it's just fantastic that this agreement just enables that to happen. Mm. Mm. It's... Um... Just to explain what I'm doing at the moment, uh, what happened was that I set out to make this film and the coronavirus hit and right. the production of the film. And what I thought I would do, I, I woke up one morning and with a very, very clear message that I have to be in service. Mm -hmm. It was as clear as that message I got through the 444. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about that and I... I thought, okay, well, look, I'm sitting at the moment on about 50 hours of filmed interview with some of the leading experts on fear, and the world is going through this paroxysm of fear. Mm -hmm. I've got to get it out there somewhere, um, but I can't finish the film. And so what I decided to do was I, I, I went back to every interviewee, I got their permission, and I, what I've done is I've cut down each, each interview originally lasted about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so what I did is I, I cut 25 minutes, uh, 25 to 30 minutes of each interview. And then I did a Zoom interview with each of them talking about fear in the current climate and how to best handle fear at the moment. And I've put that together. So each person has a content of about 45 to 50 minutes. And what I'm doing is I'm putting that up into a website uh, called Facing Fear, the Interviews, which will be a precursor to Facing Fear, the movie. Um, I'm going to have to put a price on it, which will cover my costs of construction and editing and post-production and so forth. But um, I'll, I'll make the cost low so that it's accessible. But um, so I'm hoping that it will be a really important resource for people who are dealing with fear at the moment. They can tap into it. Mm 
mm-hmm. and pick and choose as to, you know, they might find the, the combat veteran is somebody that they, that they get Relate. what they need from it or mm-hmm. somebody like Dr. Lisa Rankin who's written The Fear Cure. She's amazing. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of people that they can choose from to, um, to understand fear and get on top of it. Yeah. Fabulous. That's fantastic, Bill. Mm. I don't know if you remember last time we spoke, uh, you told me that you had all this footage from that hit the cutting room floor. Mm. And I said, what are you going to do with that footage? Can't you put it on a website? Can't we see it? You know, cause you said that you spoke to Caroline miss for about 75 minutes or something. And she's like only five minutes of her in the, in the film. Mm. Well, I, I got to I got to say, Karen, that if this works with facing fear, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go back and do the same thing with PGS, because there is some fantastic stuff there that, as you say, has never seen the light of day. Um, and it can't live on the cutting room floor; it needs to be out there so people can experience it. And um, uh, yeah. um, I think that you said that with Caroline, you when you were interviewing her, she gets so off off topic and goes off on tangents and she's so self-righteous and whatever you were thinking at the time, oh, there's nothing I can use here. <laughs> and then when you went back to it right at the end of putting the film together, you watched it again, having been a transformed man yeah. uh, and everything she said was pertinent and on point. <laughs> it's just that it wasn't. It was, yeah, it was a very interesting thing with, with Carolyn because um, um, I mean, as you know, Carolyn can be a tough, tough lady. And, <laughs> and that's what makes, it, what makes it so wonderful. Mm. Um, actually, I've got a lovely story to tell you about Carolyn in a second. But, but, but um, it's very, very true. At the end of that interview, I came away. I had a bunch of bullet notes, bullet points that I wanted to get through, and I was unable to get through any of them with Carolyn. <laughs> um, and yet, when I came to put the film together, and I, you might remember, she was the last interviewee that I looked at when I was putting the film together because I was absolutely convinced that the, the whole interview was a disaster. And then when I saw it in the context of everything else I had, I realized just how extraordinary it was because in talking in tangents, she was actually giving a whole other perspective to everybody who had been on point. Right. And that's what made it so special, but I didn't realize that at the time. And I'd love to see that whole interview, you know, it can't live on the cutting room floor. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty full on. And, you know, I was, I was pretty stupid. I mean, you might remember, I'm the person who asked Carolyn Mace, are angels useful? <laughs> and what did she say? <laughs> I kept it in the film because it, it did two things. Number one, it showed me what an idiot I was. And number two, it, um, it was a beautiful moment of cinema where, you know, she says, yes, Bill, they are useful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. I'll have to rewatch it. I think um, I was, as I was revisiting our conversation, my brother was staying with me back in 2018, who's not into any of this stuff, like yeah. works for the government, you know, works for the Navy. Uh, very logical. He's actually the most empathic being. He was a sensitive little boy and, cries at tissue commercials but spent his life overcoming his empathic abilities and becoming like spent his life becoming logical when he went to university and failed he just went back and went back and went back and went back until he didn't fail because he was just sensitive creative being that just squeezed himself into the box called what a man is supposed to be logical and get a career, get a job, buy a house, pay the mortgage, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's his world. So I watched PGS with him and it was just perfect at the time to watch it with somebody who just comes from that world of doesn't, ha- you know, have these conversations, talks about spirituality. But, yeah, it was perfect to watch it with someone like that. You know, I've seen the film with people like that and, um, and the best response I, I've, I've got is they come out of it and they go, hmm, plenty to think about. <laughs> <laughs> plenty to think about. I think we'll talk about Carolyn very quickly, and that is that um, I met up with her at uh, one of these big uh, mind, body, spirit expos in, I think it was 
near San Diego or Southern California somewhere. Anyway, I'd, um, I went to her event, which was sold out, of course, massive crowd there, and mainly just to let her know that, because we'd screen PTS to standing room only at that, at that same thing. And um, earlier that afternoon, I just wanted to let Callan know that I was there and that, um, you know, just sh show my face. Anyway, so afterwards, after her presentation, she had a book signing and she had a little table set up with her books and there was this huge line of people um, waiting to get their books signed. And on her desk was, don't ask me, I don't hug. Anyway, so I sort of waited at, at the back of the line and, you know, just because I just wanted to say hello to her. Anyway, she saw me and she got up from her table. The chair screeched back. She pushed away through the crowd, came up to me and she hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet everyone's going, oh, how come he gets a hug and we don't? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she said that she heard the film had gone down really well and how, how wonderful it was and stuff like that. But she hugged me. So brilliant. Uh, I regard that as one of the highlights of my spiritual life. Oh, I've, got a, I've got a few inside stories, just quickly, if you want, <laughs> a few inside stories of Caroline. She's not a friend of mine. She's a friend of a friend of mine who's always telling me about he, she rings him. She rings him um, probably weekly to have a chat. Yeah, she likes Australians. Yeah, and... Um, and he was saying that she's just a, a real Trump hater, right? She just mm -hmm. hates Trump. And her PA has to rein her in because when she gets up on stage, if, 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 if he comes up in conversation, she just goes off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. And he's like at the back of the room going, no, Caroline, no, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> like and reins her back mm -hmm. and get back on point. And I thought that was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. but she, yeah. What do you think of President Trump? Me. Mm. What's your perspective from well, an Australian's, yeah. you know, well, it's point an of view? Question because I actually ask this question of a lot of um, a lot of the people that I, I meet, like Paul Selig and Michael and others, James Van Prague and so forth. Um, and I'm not dodging the question, but 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 the, the unifying thing that comes back from them is that he's an important disruptor. Yeah. Um, and then you, you talked before about, um, you know, spirit looking at the pandemic, bringing, bringing things to the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much, I mean, that's pretty much my feeling as well. That, um, I, um, I have no respect for the man because he doesn't hold the values that I hold. But I do see that what's happening is that there is this extraordinary schism occurring mm -hmm. at the moment because of him, largely because of him. And that can be looked at both positively and negatively. I, pr I prefer to look at it in a positive way that um, good change can only happen mm -hmm. if, um, if the rocks get picked up and you look underneath. Well, exactly. I mean, the thing about fear and all our negative emotions, unless we face them, What's your movie called? Facing Fear? <laughs> Unless we face them, they ain't going nowhere. Mm. And so there needs to be disruptors, as you say, that uh, the pandemic disruptor, you know, that dredges it all up and when it brings it to the surface. Mm. And that's the thing about transformation. You can't let go of something that you don't know you're holding. Until, mm. you, until you can see that you're holding it, then you can let it go. So there are these fabulous things happening in our world that are dredging up all the covert... Uh, disclosure, you know, things are being disclosed in so many ways, good and bad disclosure. Mm. So what else is being disclosed is the fact that we're all God. <laughs> Physical, you know, spiritual disclosure as much as, as much as pedophilia rings coming out, like, oh, I can't tell you how many pedophilia rings I've seen that have been coming out on the news. Like, like all this, it's being all dredged up. It's all coming out in the open. So it's all good things happening. Mm. It's an exciting time to be alive, isn't it, Bill? It's an exciting time to be on Earth. I mean, you know, 
people younger than us will talk about this with their children and grandchildren. Mm. I mean, it is an incredible time to be alive and, and we're witness to tectonic change, I believe. Mm. Tectonic change. I love that. Oh, darling one, it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to speak. Oh, likewise. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I thought this, this was going to be an interview, but this has been a wonderful chat. <laughs> yeah, there are always chats. That's what I do. I have conversations. I don't really interview oh, yes. people. But yeah. It's been great catching up and I'm excited. I'm really excited about this, um, this new project that you're doing. When you mentioned it on the last show, I'm going to do a project about fear, I went, oh, really? But now it all is, makes perfect sense. It's mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, even... The fact that you knew you were going to do it before the fires hit, the floods hit, the pandemic hit, and now the riot. I mean, even the fact that you, you were going to do it before all that happened, you were mm -hmm. listening to your guidance. You were listening, mm -hmm. that you were going to, you know, explore it because that's what we're doing globally. We're exploring it, mm -hmm. exploring fear. So mm -hmm. thank you for your work, Bill. Oh, thank you, Karen, for your work. It's, um, I can't do what I'd do without your help and so thank you. Another beautiful conversation with the fabulous Bill Bennett. I hope you enjoyed that. I know I did. He opened up a lot more this time than he did last time. Just told me a few more stories. But um, I have to say, I do love to chat, don't I? I watched the last show I did with him and I was very chatty. I was saying to him before that when I feel like someone isn't going to talk, if they're not real talkers I just talk a lot and tell a lot of stories hoping that it'll draw the information out of them and which it did it worked um, it works it's a conversation and he said to me afterwards that was a beautiful conversation it wasn't an interview and I said I never do interviews I only do conversations <laughs> so it took him a couple of shows but he got it I guess as being someone who's been a journalist you know for many years he's used to interviewing people so when you interview people you fire questions at them and you don't give your point of view or your stories. You just fire questions at them, sit back and wait for them to answer. That's not how we roll here. We have conversations because I've got as much to say as anybody else, as you know. <laughs> as you know. But as we share our stories, that's what a conversation is. As you share a story, it reminds them of the story. They go, well, that reminds me. This happened to me. So it's a great way of, um, yeah, it's a conversation. Anyway, uh, what have I got to say? We were just chatting after the show about um, all the people that he's got coming up on, uh, on the Facing Fear docu-series and the film. Some fascinating people, some of them I know personally and yeah, interesting, so it should be great. So stay tuned, I'll let you all know when it comes out. We'll have another conversation with Bill when it, COVID finally lets people get back to work and get things rocking and rolling. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say too much more. I'm feeling a bit under the weather today, so I'm going to just take it easy and have a, another drink of water and a cup of tea and uh, finish editing the last highlights from the Inner Sanctum that we did with Belinda Womack on Monday. It was beautiful. And uh, Robert Schwartz is coming up next month in the in Inner Sanctum, who I've had on the show. He has um, He talks about our our um, agreement, sacred agreement, soul plan, that's what he calls it, which we touched on in the conversation with Bill. He said, spirit uses you people that have got these skills. And I'm saying, yeah, but that was a plan before you even get here. <laughs> it's not like, oh, that person has good skills. Let me use them. It's like the agreement is all sorted before you get here. So it's going to be fascinating talking with Robert. He is a wealth, a wealth of information. It'll be fascinating talking with him. And as you know, I am online every week. If you want to talk to me and my mob, they have plenty to say too. I have to say, I think I love people that come on the show like Belinda. They just reiterate what my mob tell me. And that's why I love that. It's like this confirmation. Not that I doubt them or judge them. It's just great to have confirmation. I think that all good readings or good teachings is just speaking to what your soul already knows and so it's just that confirmation that you are you know who you are and why you're here and you've got your tapped in turned on tuned in to higher guidance that's what it's all about so i love you all see you all next time big love bye for now